Um, but the first question that I would, uh, I would ask is, how do you justify an idea of equal equality of genders in Islam when there are so many ways in which Islam sees women as less than men? For example, they list women praying behind men, women having to obey or submit to their husbands, women not being able to perform hajj without a male mahram, so on and so forth. Get your facts first checked out, whoever wrote this question. A woman must disobey her husband and go to Hajj. So I don't know where you got the idea of they have to have the permission of their husbands. Now, if Saudi Arabia have it in their visa application, that's their choice. But Hajj is an obligation. The woman should go even without her husband's permission. When God called her, it's enough, done. Does she need a man with her for protection? Maybe, 1400 years ago, yeah. Does she need a man now? Maybe not. There is enough safety. I mean, she's going from Chicago landing in Medina. Everyone with her, you know, are hujjaj. It's safe over there. So the idea was safety. It was not men traveling with women. And we have a hadith. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you live, Ya Adi, you're going to travel from Yemen. You're going to see the young. Al-Dha'ina is the 14, 15 year old girl. If you live long, Ya Adi, you will see the young 14, 15 year old girl traveling from Yemen to Mecca by herself, fearing no one but Allah. Meaning what? The issue of mahram is not masculinity males, it was safety. If it was delivered through a family member, good. If it was delivered through another group of women with her, good. If it was delivered through going with a group with the sheikh, whatever the means is. Why do women pray behind men? Normal, because they don't feel comfortable with men looking at their butts. I mean, bottom line. Very simple. Ask any sister of yours, she would not feel comfortable that there's a man just behind her doing that. So it was out of respect for her own feelings. <clears throat> Women come to the masjid with kids. If her child cries and she needs to take him to change for him, she doesn't have to cross like 20 lines until she gets out. It'll be easy for her to go out. So get your facts checked. What is being set as matters in Islam? What is more practical? What is more relevant to real issues of problem solving decisions? And that's how fiqh is being. Are there abuses? Yes. There are some scholars and people who sometimes misinterpret things and but this is the way we see things. I could just add one word on this. So terminology is important. Quite often we get sucked into terminology that somebody else is using coming from a different theology, from a different philosophy, and we are using the same thing, right? So often you talk about equality. E we need to differentiate between the word equal and equivalent. Equal and equivalent. Is a Honda Civic equal to a Toyota Corolla, unless you're a car enthusiast. For most people, you're like, yeah, it's about the same. Same horsepower, same. But are they equal? No, they're not exactly the same. They're different. Are they equivalent? Yes, they are. Functionally, they do the same. So think about the difference between the word equal and equivalent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created males and females different than one another. Absolutely. There are certain differences Sisters don't have to pray at certain times. They don't have to fast at certain times. Men do. There's differences. Absolutely. Physical differences. So are they equal using the words that perhaps certain philosophies use? No. Are they equivalent? Yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed them with certain things that he has not blessed men with. And he has blessed men with certain things that he has not blessed women with. But ultimately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to judge us based on each one of our own activities. And we'll get to Jannah or not based on that not based on what was required of somebody else. So think about the difference between equal and equivalent and how that applies to a lot of the questions that we may ask and think about. Dr. Nadim, in one of, your, in one of the things that you were saying, you were explaining how chores will make better bonds about 
will make better bonds in the household. What do you mean by that? So I gave the example of washing dishes, but it could be any other chores that you're doing around the house. And the idea is that as you are working and doing things in the house, it allows for small talk. It allows you to have side conversation in an indirect fashion, as opposed to perhaps you're sitting down with your family member and asking, hey, tell me what happened with your day. And they're listing out, well, this happened, that happened. But they might be uncomfortable. I'll tell you, with my kids, every time I sit down and ask them, like one of my kids' standard answer, how was your day? Regular. So anything happened? Not regular. Like her, her favorite word is regular. And I tease her so much. The only way I can get her to talk is like, all right, you know what? We're going to do stuff together. So we're doing something around the house. And on the side, you're chatting, hey, what happened? And she's like, oh, my friend did this, and this happened, this happened. And suddenly you get all of the stories coming out. Doing chores is one way, but basically being together, what sociologists call building a shared narrative. When you are experiencing things together, you build a shared narrative. You think about it, you know what? You talk to your good friend and say, hey, remember when we went camping last summer? And you stop right there, and the three of them start laughing. Ha, 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 ha. You don't have to say anything else. Why? Because that was trigger enough for them to remember, oh yeah, we went out on the lake, we were you know, joking around, and the boat capsized, and then we had to swim, and everything got wet, blah, blah, blah. But all you said was, remember when we went camping last summer? That relies on you having had that experience together, that relies on you remembering those things together. How many things are we doing with our family members? such that you're building that shared narrative so that you can reflect on that, on the good times and the bad times and get information. It really does help build those strong bonds between the family members to be doing things together. Next question, how can we challenge masculinity in Arab communities where building a strong and dominant character is encouraged without compromising self-image in the community or portraying a soft or weak authority? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, religion is one thing and culture is another thing. <clears throat> one person came to me and said, my daughter got accepted at MIT. So should I let her go and, you know, get educated over there? I said, yeah, what's the problem? You know, I said, but me as a parent, I want my son to stay in Chicago. So it's not about males and females. Sometimes there are personal family matters that are discussed within the family, that there are preferences for their choice. They could be fair, or or they could be abusive. Uh, the dominant culture in Arab has to do with fear. And I assume probably not just Arab, maybe other, other cultures have the same issue. Fear plus ignorance create all kinds of complicated outcomes. When you fear something, and you are ignorant of its you know, matters, then you're going to innovate ideas that could not be of Adil and Ihsan. And this is what I feel a lot of Arab families or whatever you know, ethnicity we are talking about. Let me talk because I'm Arabic, so I will be offended. That they fall into that trap because they think they want to care for someone but they don't look at, are they crossing the line of someone else's rights, even if it was your own daughter or your own wife or your own sister. And with that matter, it is the role of the imams and the member. It is the role of the educators. It is the role of the literature. It is the role of lectures to focus on ethics, adil and ihsan. That's the long-term challenge that we are to face because the other scenario is that girls are going to keep complaining until they go and 
extremely, you know, go on the opposite side. And boys are going to utilize that uh, yeah, any prestige status and abuse it in more ways that could be harmful to themselves and to the family. As you compare, there's actually several more questions, but just for the sake of time, we also have highest hearts, which we want to introduce as well. Um, there's just one more question that I would like to ask, or that of the, of the questions that are here. Uh, please comment on masculinity and the danger of pornography and the danger of homosexuality as well. You start that off. So pornography is now recognized uh, medically as an addictive behavior. So you may have thought about it as bad behavior before, but now research has proven and shown that our pornography is addictive behavior. You don't just watch one thing. The chemicals that are released in the brain bring you back more and more and more and more, and they change the shape and the form of what's happening in the brain. So it's very addictive behavior that leads to improper behavior outside. Because what you're doing is you're taking this fantasy land and you're forcing it into your own life and you're trying to do something that's not real. You're gonna mess up all sorts of relationships beyond what you're doing to your brain. So pornography is real, the addiction is real. There are a whole lot of resources to help people uh, understand and deal with this challenge of pornography. What were some of the other things that were mentioned? Pornography homosexuality. and then homosexuality. So homosexuality is rampant in our society now, or so we're led to believe, right? And I say so we're led to believe because um, you, you have to keep in mind the difference between what is portrayed from a media perspective what versus what happens on the ground. Because we may think that, you know what, every third person is homosexual now. But in reality, you, when you look at the data in terms of surveys, you know, homosexuality is there, has been there, has been there for a long time. The number of people who express themselves as being homosexual is there is increasing, slightly increasing. But the actual numbers haven't changed that much. But the exposure has changed a lot. And so in our mindset, sometimes we think this has become a huge thing. What has become huge, though, is the exposure in society and the acceptability of this behavior in society. So from our perspective, I mean, Sheikh, if I can shed more light on this, Islamically, homosexuality is not acceptable. There should not be any question about that. But at the same time, as Muslims, there's a lot of things that we say is things are unacceptable. There's one sin that will not be forgiven. It's not homosexuality. It's shirk. Right? So somebody who's a homosexual, sometimes because of our cultural things, or like this guy's like, oh my God, I'm not going to shake hands with them. I'm not going to go close to them physically. It's like you start treating people in a very inhuman way. Yes, he may be doing something that is un-Islamic. Agreed. But so is the guy who's drinking. So is the guy who's fornicating. So is the guy who's engaging in so many other behaviors. Somebody who actively engages in shirk, you'll happily shake their hand, hug them on stage, do interfaith activities, no problem. Knowing that this is one sin that will not be forgiven. But somebody who's homosexual, yeah, I can't shake, I, I can't touch you. Our mindset has become very different. So be very careful of that. Understanding that, yes, we do not engage in that behavior. We think that is wrong behavior. It is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited. But still, at the end of the day, these are human beings who are brothers and sisters in humanity. And we want to work to bring them back to the path and say, you know what, this is not the best behavior. Just as somebody who might be drinking or gambling or engaging in all sorts of other behaviors that's inappropriate, we bring them back to the right path with wisdom, inshallah.